Okay. So can everyone see my screen now? No, I can see your face, not your screen. How about now? Yeah, I can yeah, see your perfect. screen now. Thank you. So, um, hi everyone. Welcome to um session. So, the title for today is um designing products for mobile. And my name is Adenike Afonja, and I hope you guys learn a lot from this session and. Yeah, I don't know how long it's going to be for, but I just really hope you have like something to take away from. So um, before we get started, I'm just going to run you guys through a brief about myself and um, how long I've been designing and essentially my journey to the design industry, so to say. So um, first, currently I'm a product designer with eTransact Global UK. I don't know if any of you guys know it transact but yes that's the nigerian branch and we're currently building a team in the uk so i work for the uk team before then i started out as a um front-end developer can you guys hear me because i'm not exactly sure so I know yes we can okay okay yeah so um before then i started out as um a front-end developer and i still code right now which is like 20 18 after i left school i decided to teach myself how to code because i studied um electrical and electronics engineering in school um, i've always wanted to code but the semester i tried to like juggle school and coding i actually had like bad result for that semester so i just told myself that you know what once i'm done with school i'll probably just pick up coding and everything so yeah my first internship while coding um I was introduced into design because at the time the design guy had just quit there. Um, so my boss took me to just learn design since it's like the preliminary phase before you actually start coding. But I wasn't really, really interested, but I just learned it because, you know, when you learn something just because you have to do it, yeah. So that's what happened. I just learned it and I delivered the project as I did. It wasn't anything so elaborate. It was an e-commerce project, but half of it, to be honest, was like, I was taught and I just like researched a lot and I just copied whatever I saw. Well, luckily for me, the clients liked it. So we just moved on. Then I got my next job, which was doing NYC, it was also a code job because I was interested in coding and I was coding. But then again, this my boss as at the time to really like design and he didn't want to employ a designer. So he decided to have me also take good design and code. So I would always have to like design first and then translate my designs to code all by myself. Cause I was the only one with like design knowledge, but it wasn't anything elaborate at the time. So, and after that, but like two months into designing and coding, I realized that I was actually more drawn to design. Like other times when I could, I was coding because I had to, but with design, even when I had nothing to do, I was myself on Drupal, like researching designs and just wanting to just design something, whether it made sense or not, and it just show people and all. So I decided to like dedicate like a month after my NYC to, before I got a job post NYC, I decided to dedicate a month to, to designing. So I improved my design. I like just Googled up resources and I reached out to like some people. At the time, my close friend was a full blown designer. So she introduced me to Figma at the point and then I started designing. But then fast forward later, I got a job with Nibs, which was my first job post um anyway and it was a full design role so that's when i actually started designing full time and after that so like eight months into nibs then i joined a transact so that's currently where i am i'm a product designer but um to be honest even at a transact i still code so i'm like a ui developer and then a product designer but i stick to front end just front end and i don't really use um any framework before I used to use Angular, but now I just do like only UI development. I just do like HTML, CSS, and vanilla JavaScript. So I still code on this side. And for well, our front end products are eTransact um, Global, which is Excel. That's the name for the UK team in Excel. We are, I actually handle most of the web development on the front end side. And 
I also convert them to I, I like I go from design to code. So I design and then I actually code the front end for we have like mobile developers. So yeah, so design has been interesting. One thing I like most about my design journey is the fact that it didn't take me so long to actually realize that it was design I eventually wanted to do. And I'm grateful for the experience because I mean, if I didn't have like bosses who were interested in design, I probably would have been stuck to coding. I probably won't enjoy it as much as I currently enjoy designing. So that's that's about that. So that's yeah, all about my design journey. So before we get any further, does anyone have any questions considering my journey? And after this, we're going to have like an icebreaker because um, I know there are about like 17 people on this call, but I don't know everyone on the call. So we're going to have like an interactive section where everyone just introduces themselves. You say a fun thing about yourself and why you love designing or why you want to move into design if you are an aspiring designer or you're just starting out. So um, let's see, we'll start with Peace, Adejo. Or does anyone want to go first? So let me, let me just, yeah. So I'm just going to pick people at random from my screen. So Peace, do you want to go first? Hi. Hi, Denny. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Apparently it's like 12.28, so that's like afternoon. Good <laughs> afternoon, everyone. It's quite hazy around here, so we can't really uh, see the sun. <laughs> Okay. Um, I I am a little like you. I kind of um, I started out with front end when I started uh, delving into tech. I started out with front end as well, but then I realized um, I would rather be a part of creating the designs and know what that's about rather than just it's like you're taking orders from somebody and you are implementing them. So. I felt more at home when I, it was kind of a leap of faith for me because I hadn't tried out anything design ever before a student. So when I, um, I, I, I just jumped into it and I was like, why not? If I'm getting bored with creating other people's designs, let me try to create my own. And I did that and it's, it's been great so far. Yeah. Okay, that's good to know. So tell us one fun thing about you. Just one fun thing. Fun, fun, fun. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I don't know really. I don't. I, I, I like to sing. I like to sing karaoke. I don't know if anyone else thinks that's uh, fun. But yeah, I like. To that was what I was going. So to like me, I, I love music, and when I'm alone and I'm listening to music all by myself, I literally act as if I'm in the music video of it. Well, I mean, no one gets to see. It's always just me and my private space. So yeah. Okay. Thank you, Peace. Thanks for sharing. Um, who would like to go next? Um, let's see. Kenneth, do you want to go next? Um, are you there? Okay. I don't know. If it's there. Okay. Um. Uh, Daniel. Yes. Good afternoon, everybody. Can you guys hear me? Good afternoon. Can you guys hear me? Yes, you can. Uh, my name is Daniel. Um, my journey into UI UX is well, I've been seeing um, UI UX <coughs> um, design grow in recent years, and I've not been seeing it. Uh, uh, I've been seeing it two times too, and um, I studied architecture, and after school, I'll be doing architecture, but then um, I've gotten rather bored of it because of the growth potential and stuff, but then um, I'm looking to um, change like um, career path and I just felt like UIUS was a natural transition for me because um, in architecture we already touched on a lot of the elements that uh, we use in UIUS design. 
So I felt like a natural transition for me. That's it. Want to share any fun thing about yourself, or we move forward? Um, fun thing. Um, uh, I can float in water for a really long time. Yeah, in the pool, <laughs> or in the river, I can float for a really long time. So I guess that's fun less than one. Okay. okay. All right. Thanks, Daniel. Okay, so um, so we don't run behind time. So thanks for thanks to the people who shared their journey and fun things about them. So, so like I said, the topic for today is um designing products for mobile. I don't know if any of you guys have ever done anything mobile uh, mobile design, but yeah. So today we're going to be delving deeper into how you should um, start out when designing product for mobile, things you should consider, all of that. So we're talking about what it is, how it is used, the designing for different mobile user cases, approaches for designing products for mobile, the, um, some guidelines and best practices for designing for mobile, then key differences between the mobile platforms, iOS and Android, then I would um, give you guys a take home, which, which is what I meant by um, Take it to Figma, to Figma again. Yeah. So if you guys have any questions along the line, um, you can just jot it down. Then once I'm done, or you can raise your hand or something, just send me a private message. Then as um as I cover each topic, you can just drop a message for me on the chat. Then after that, we can review all the questions together and we'll talk about it. Okay. All right. Um, please, so that I know that I'm not just rambling. If you guys can just give some feedback, like, okay, yes, no, that kind of things, because I'm not sure if you guys can hear me so that I will know that okay, my network is good and everyone is on the same page as I am. So should we proceed? Oh, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so first, we'll be starting with design and what it is. So let me just move this down to the end. So designing for mobile and what it is. So the first one is um, so designing apps or website for mobile, it means taking into account the differences in the way that users can interact with the device and then shaping the experience of the final product to take advantage of the strength of the platform while avoiding as best as possible the weaknesses. So we all know that when you're designing for mobile, mobile devices are totally different from desktop devices in terms in terms of space you know desktop they are like big and literally you can't carry your desktop all around you compared to mobile i think virtually 90 percent of everyone always has their mobile phones on them wherever they're going to so but at the same time the amount of estate area which you have on a desktop in terms of space and how large the screen is for your view for a user is, is totally different from the amount of estate area you have on your mobile so then when you're designing for mobile, you now want to consider that, oh, how do I want to interact? Why do I want my users to interact with this device? Knowing that there's little space, but I actually want them to focus on the task at the time. Then first, you actually want to consider the context of use. So essentially, you're considering, you're asking yourself what the user's task and what is the context of use. So as a designer, when you're approaching design for mobile, you want to be thinking that, okay, what is the mobile experience here? That how can I design for a screen that has little estate area, which I like to call legroom, because when you're in the plane, if you're like in the economy seat, there's little area for you to actually stretch your legs. But compared to someone who's like in the business class, they could even sleep comfortably when they're on the plane. So that's what, that's um, akin to estate area in design term. So you're asking yourself, you should be asking yourself as a designer that, oh, how can I design for a screen with little SD area while keeping it focused on the user's task and you're getting rid of the extra interface. You know that the SD area is small, but at the same time, you don't want to overwhelm your user. So the things you have to figure out are the user's task and then what is the context of use. So uh, moving on. So mobile design should be about the task the user wants to carry out and how to ensure that the user experience 
with that. So essentially, that's what, um, that's what mobile design is for that. Then next, we have um, how it is used. So like I said, this boils down to context in the sense that how a user is going to interact with a desktop is totally different from how a user is going to interact with a mobile device in the sense of if I'm using a desktop, that means I'm probably going to be seated or focused or I actually have like a large amount of terms. In fact, the desktop area is not something handy, it's not something I can actually carry about. So usually you, are, you want to figure out the context in which a mobile device would be used. And you can get this often time through research, is ability testing and other forms of research that out there. Maybe you speak to people, you um, you have people gather in a room and you observe their patterns in which they interact with the device. Then I said that, um, but often the use of a certain type of device also implies a lot about the way users engage with that given device. For example, reading the news on a desktop computer. This means that if users access your mobile um, products from their desk, that's awesome, like it's going to be interesting, but many users don't because they're either going to be trying to use them as supermarkets or on a daily commute to work, or maybe we are working to the cafe or they're working to their friend's house. So knowing that this is the context that your users are going to be using your mobile products, you want to make sure that you give them, you, give, you deliver great experiences while also focusing on the tasks that they want to perform and not overwhelming them. But in the sense of, um, of mobile, so, I have this research study that shows that users' attention to their cells or mobile spans between a mere four and eight seconds. What does this mean? That means that whatever task that you want your users to perform is not supposed to last more than this. Like the main task that is apparent on your page should not take more than four or eight seconds because anything longer is just going to frustrate them. And imagine if I'm working and I'm trying to make a transfer but I can't even go logging into the application. I can't even find the transfer button. And then, I'm, and you know that I'm, I'm working, I'm not concentrating on where I'm going. So that means my attention in that moment is divided. I can't focus on my work. And at the same time, I'm frustrated because I can't get a hang of where the transfer button on the, on the application is. So there's, a, there's a case and the possibility that I'm actually run into a tree or there might be an accident. And you actually don't want your user saying that, oh, I had an accident while using Sosos's mobile product. So you actually don't want to use it. So you want to make sure that you keep them attentive and you also make sure that the main task that you want them to perform on your application is actually apparent. So essentially, you want to consider how to reduce distractions, which is what I talked about my, by making your main task apparent. And you make it easy for the user to focus on the task at hand such that they don't say, oh, I was frustrated while using this mobile device, or why, sorry, why using this mobile product, essentially, yeah. I guess following, sorry, let me bring this back up. Uh, let's see. Hi, are you guys following, sorry? Yes. Yeah, we're following. Thank you. All right. Thanks. So, yeah. So moving on, we have um designing for mobile, and we'll be talking about the mo mobile user cases. So, you might the mobile user cases talk. We're going to be looking at the different types of users when it that uses mobile products. So. When designing a mobile product, you want to be sure to take into account and understand all the use cases of your app in order to design not just an elegant solution, but one that is user friendly and centered. Knowing this, there are different mobile user cases. One, you have the full attention people, you have speed attention people, and then lastly, you have on the go people. The first one, full attention, these are mobile users that are akin to desktop laptop users. So full attention means that I'm concentrated. My attention is not like, divided. I'm not trying to talk to my friend while making the transfer. I'm not trying to talk to my friend while reading an article. 
So you actually have their full attention. So that's why I link them to desktop because if I'm using a desktop, I'm seated. That means I have all the time. I'm probably not washing out on like mobile device that you're actually on the, on the go oftentimes. So the main constraint here is the size of the screen. Everyone knows how large desktop devices are ranging from, you can have like 12 inch screen to a 16 inch screen to your to 32 inch. If you use like monitors and iMacs, they are like really, really large and they have like extra, like extreme amount of space. So the question then becomes, how might we dovetail all the main features and functionalities of our application into a tiny screen with little legroom and still deliver a great mobile experience for this user? So knowing that desktop users are like totally different from mobile users, so you, how do you make sure that all the features that are available on your desktop, that's for products that actually have the desktop version and they have the web version, the desktop version, and have the mobile version. So it, are you not going to say that, oh, I'm going to limit some of the features on my desktop and then put just a little on mobile on my mobile just because you don't have enough room? That's not possible because if I'm interacting with your product on your desktop, and my friend is using on the mobile, we are going to be seeing two completely different things. And then we got as oh, the experience is totally, is totally different. But you actually want to ensure consistency in your brand so that what user A sees on your desktop is what you can be get to see on your mobile as well. So, second, we have the split attention users. Split attention means at the ones that are in focus at all, the level of interrupt, interruption rather and distraction is really high. So the level of interruption and distraction during mobile use is all too real. Oftentimes, users are dividing their attention between the mobile app and some other activity they are doing. I can be using my phone, like I said, I'm talking to a friend. I can, there might be someone queue at the grocery store and I just decide to bring up my wallet. I can even be using my phone right there in front of the, um, the salesman that's attending me on the payment team. So that, these are split attention people because my entire attention is actually not devoted to the product I'm using at that moment. So in this case, you want to make the main task apparent. You don't want your users to go on a scavenger hunt just to find the primary task they want to perform. So if I'm supposed to be able to make a transfer, let's say I'm on the queue to pay for something I bought at, um, at the supermarket, and then immediately I log into your, your, your the mobile product, I can't find the um, button that says, oh, make a transfer or pay. And I have to go around the, around the whole application just because I'm looking for a single button. That's like a scavenger hunt, which is totally unnecessary because it's really that there's someone at the other end is waiting for me to make the transfer so he can attend to the next customer. You don't want to do that. So make sure that your text should be clear. At times, when I'm not looking, even on WhatsApp, I do that a lot. I'm like typing a message and looking and trying to listen in on someone. So if I, I've got, my brain already knows where the send button is. So imagine if the send button isn't something I can easily see, and then I mistakenly send the, mes um, the message I'm typing to the wrong person. That's like, that's, a pro um, that's going to be sad for me because that's not the intended person or intended recipient I was going to send it to. So your text should be clear and large enough to read quickly with your action buttons within reasonable reach. I shouldn't have to overstretch my thumb because I want to click on a button and all of that. So thirdly, you have on the go. So these, are used, these users literally have no time to waste. Their attention span is at the minimal as they are most likely in a rush but still need to get the task done. Imagine if um, you're going for a job application and you forgot that, oh, you're supposed to actually mail the CV to the HR person. So in that moment, you act, you're actually late. You're like five minutes behind schedule for your interview, but you know you still have to send the CV before you appear in front of the HR. So how then do you design for such scenarios? Number one, you have to make sure that you cut to the chase. So let's say you were, um, you were asked to use a particular um, mobile app to send the CV. Once I log in, am I going to see where it says, oh, attach CV and then send? Or is that when you're asking me, oh, I should fill in a long as form asking for me for my mother's first name or my father's middle name, all that thing. So you want to cut the cheese. The user flow should be straightforward. This is not the time you have to start asking them about all their giving names or hobbies when all they just want to do is sign up. 
oftentimes, even I personally, when I'm applying for something, I'm trying to register for a mobile product and that the user input are too long, I just abandon it. So how much more other users out there? So you have to make sure that you always cut the chase. Number two, make use of the device input controls. Thankfully, most of our smartphone devices, they actually come with things that make it easy for you to use mobile to interact with the product. A good example is um Google Map. Google Map before the voice um command thing, you have to always look oh 300 meters. Am I almost at the turning? But with the voice prompt that comes with it now, the lady always say oh at the next turn in turn right at the next um at the um next ramp take the exit to the whatever whatever you they are making good use of voice commands where appropriate so that you can also focus on where you're going without getting distracted. So if your device, if your product can make use of the inbuilt controls that, that come with most mobile devices, I would advise you to go for it. Yes, not everybody uses smartphones, but for the ones that are smartphones, you're essentially making their life easier. And that is what design is. Design is all about so, you know, making people's life easier and solving their problems. So yeah, so that's for the different mobile user cases that we have. As a recap, you have the full attention, you have the split attention, you have the on-the-go. So if you want to make your product user-friendly and you want to keep your users coming back, you have to make sure that you take into account all of these type of users that are going to be using your product because that the ones are going to generate the funds that you want to um, or the return on investment in your product essentially. So yeah. So um, moving on, next we have, so now that we know all these different scenarios and we know how our users are going to be interacting with our products on mobile. So the question now is how then do we approach it? Making sure that we incorporate all of this that we've gathered from our research that well, our users are either going to be on the go or their attentions are going to be divided or they are going to be trying to use it on their way um, on their daily commutes, whether they're coming from work or they're going home and all of that. So how then do you approach designing your product for mobile? So um, as a reiteration, because you're designing for a device with little legroom or estate area, if you decide to use that word, it doesn't mean that you have to shrink all your features into the app screen, thereby overwhelming the user. It means focusing on what matters to the mobile user and delivering a great experience. So in order for you to do this successfully, you need to focus on the user task. What is the main thing that the user wants to do when he or she interacts with my product? Then how are they going to be executed? How do I make sure that I put the right features that makes it easy for them to carry out all their, use, all their tasks in one click of the button? or in one click of a button or with few clicks of a button. I don't want to have to go to 20 steps just because I want to carry out my major task while interacting with your product. So then how then do we approach designing for mobile? One, you have fit the task, fit the UI style guide, design for VIP, keep communicating, and then keep on the task. So we are going to talk about all of this. The first one, which is fit the task. This is making sure that your strategy as you lay out your design, your features and your functionalities actually fit into what users want to do. So this involves taking a task oriented design approach. So in a um, design term, there's something called the task oriented design approach, which is what I define here that says it's an approach to systems development that places a heavy focus on finding out the goals that users need to meet while interacting with the system. And then you're designing that system or your product in this case, so that it best accommodates the task that leads to accomplishing these goals. The process of breaking down the user's goal into task is called task analysis. So a task-oriented design approach means that you're focusing on the goals that users want to meet while interacting with your product. And then you're not designing your product around that goals and then nothing more. Because essentially, once I come into your product, what does your product say it does? Oh, it says that it offers me, um, um, let's say, I can book an appointment for a doctor. So if I actually go into the mobile version of your product, am I 
able to actually book an appointment to see a doctor because that is all your product, that's your product core value proposition. So you want to make sure that you focus on what the user's need are and the goals of the users, and then you design your product around those user needs and goal. So as a designer, now that you know that you have to fit fit, sorry, fit the task, some things you want to consider in order to make your design fit the task at hand. And number one, you have to consider the task environment. This is almost similar to the scenario in which your product, people are going to be interacting with your product on your mobile. So you think about where the user wants to use product and the problem they are trying to solve, e.g. you are stranded somewhere and need to get a cab. So I'm going to throw this question to the audience. Imagine that you are a user and then um, you are stranded somewhere, you need to get a cab, let's say you're going to see your friend but you missed your, you missed, um, your way and then there's ta um, Taxify or Uber around them. So as a user, what is one thing you are hoping to get done as soon as you open the app? Does anybody want to answer? I don't know, did you guys get the question? Okay. It says um, to get a driver or a ride. Yes, yeah, so that's that's correct. So that's correct. So essentially, if I'm opening a taxi file Uber app, what I want to do is get a cab as soon as possible. So as a designer, you know that there's a possibility that would users can be stuck somewhere and you, so you want to design your mobile app flow in such a way that users can book a cab in no time with few clicks of a button that's not the time whereby because i know um taxify and uber especially taxify they actually do this a lot whereby if i log into the app they start telling me about a field car transaction and i know that i'm in a hurry i really want to book this car because i'm probably late to my appointment or i don't have any time at hand but that's the time that reminded me about a field transaction i think that's like totally wrong because the push notifications you could have sent to me early on before logging into the app if i'm making contact with your app oftentimes 90 percent of the time is because i want to actually use the app to do what it essentially says it does which is booking a cab or a rider and getting me to my destination so knowing this you want to tell me know if that's the time to be asking them to rate a driver or remind them of a field um, car debit when you're supposed to actually first try and help them to get a cab as soon as possible so it is best you consider the task environment and make sure that whatever thing that you're sending is timely and you actually know when to ask them the right questions at all times so essentially you let you let the user focus on things that main point that are the main pain points which in this scenario it is booking a cab or getting it right to your destination at the time and not focus on secondary actions which in this case might be racing a driver for my last trip or reminding me about the field debit card transaction for my last trip because either ways i'm still going to pay for it whether i like it or not so yeah so that's for considering the task environment. The next thing you want to do is create value, promote your core value proposition. I don't know if everybody here knows what core value proposition is, but um, your core value proposition is essentially the, the, I'll call it the spice or the extra sauce on your product, which your product claims to offer. You want to make sure that you actually sell your product. Because now everybody that has an idea, everybody's building a product. Oh, I got this idea that um, um, parents can monitor their kids while they're on their way home. They're building it into a product or building it into a mobile app. Everybody is churning out a mobile app every now and then. So the question now remains that how do you ensure that your product stands out? Because if you can't distinguish um, and clearly communicate what your products and the features are, or what you aim to achieve with this product on the market, then it's, I think it's just going to be another product that is lost in the back, black hole of products with no real value to people. That is why you see some of all these products, they have like a good start, but at the end of the day, there's no continuous um, value to people. So then people abandon it and then they go over to use some other product that actually 
delivers what it, what it says it will deliver. So make sure that you actually sell your product. Make the main thing that your product does apparent from the first time a user interacts or finds out about your product. This is this all boils down to your um your call to action buttons. Make sure that they are clear on your mobile. Let and let it do what it actually says it's supposed to do. Don't say that oh my product is going to help you to make um video calls or booking house appointments with a doctor instead of going to a physical hospital. Then when I enter the book appointment button is not even working or I'm saying that there are no doctors available. That's like a total turn off and people are just going to abandon your app, your products and your mobile app. So make sure that you actually sell your product and let it do what it says that it actually does. Then engage with and know your users. To be honest, this is like the first thing for in a time where everybody talks about user research, I didn't want to just throw it straight up in your face, but this is at the core of every product that you're churning out. This is the first important thing when starting out designing a mobile product. You want to make sure that you're designing for the role and hats your users will wear, because these are the people that are going to use your products. It's not your family members, yes, your friends. If it's like a social app, your friends might actually use it, but there are more users out there. You just don't want to limit your product to just family and friends. That's not going to bring you the return on investment of all your time and money that you invested in product. So you want to make sure that you're designing for the role and hats your users will wear. This is often figured out through research. So you want to make sure that you research, 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 talk to people, let them know how they're using other products. If your product is something that is similar to other products on the market, like Uber and Taxify. If I want to come to the market with something that does what Uber and Taxify does, I would have to talk and engage with people who are already interacting or using Uber and Taxify. Like, how are they using Uber and Taxify? What do they think I can improve or add to my own to make it like the extra source or like the juicy part of my own product? So learning about your customers or users, their emotions, their life, their context, all of this will give you great insights into what they expect from your product. Because if I'm using a product like Uber and you are coming to the market with another product that's like Uber, I will, at the core, I will expect it to function just the same way Uber and Taxify already function because I already know that oh, they do what they want to do. Then you kind of add an extra thing that actually sets you apart from Uber and Taxify. So, Users expect that your product will function the same way others do. So you make sure that you're not delivering anything lesser than what it sets out to actually deliver. So you want to make sure that the functionality fits the situation and then you're on the road to relevance to your users at the cost. So that's it. Um, let's see, I don't know why do I keep doing this? Okay, so next. You have to, we're still talking about how to approach your mobile product design. This is, um, you have to fit the UI style guide. This is making sure that the functions that you offer follow patterns that deliver great experience across all devices in a consistent way. First, you consider the platform. We know, we all know that um, mobile devices are actually, there are different types of mobile devices, but at the core you have Android and iOS devices. So because your users might be engaging with your app on two different platforms, iOS or Android, you want to make sure that the experience user it gets when he uses it on an iOS device, it's the same that user B gets when he or she uses it on an Android device. This you can do by familiarizing yourself with the platform guidelines and knowing what should change and what can stay the same. So for iOS, you have the human interface and for Android, you have the material design guide so you have to familiarize yourself although now everybody tries to infuse an element that works on both platform like it's called native design so you're infusing elements from ios and also infusing elements from android to fit and whereas but if you're designing for just ios then you actually don't need to worry about android because then you're making you're only targeting ios device users and also, if you're device, um, designing for Android, you're also targeting people that use Android devices. So then you're focusing on material design guide. So you make sure that you consider the platform. Don't use controls that are meant for Android and then move them to iOS. That's not that's not proper. Make sure that whatever controls they are using, 
they are consistent and then they are within reach in your application and then users know where they can always find all of your controls in your application so that's considered the platform which is ios or android next you have um consider the mobile patterns so just because a pattern is trending it doesn't make it a right fit for your product e.g using a pool to refresh do your users really need it what if they won't be using your product on a touchscreen device and are you making an alternative to that knowing that they won't be using on a touchscreen device a perfect example is twitter i don't know if you guys have ever if you guys have ever noticed but if you have like um a touchscreen device twitter has this function that says put to refresh whereby i can swipe up down from my screen and ref and then i get to see new tweets also for people who probably don't have that um control on their devices there's the option of a, a sticky button that appears at the top of your of your twitter page that shows or oh, click to see new new tweets so that's proper design thinking or people who actually take into cognizance of the fact that have, um, some of their users might not be interacting with their product on on a touch screen device then they make it um what's it called they make it relevant to both parties whereby for people who use touch screen device there's the option to swipe or to pull to refresh and then for people who don't use touch screen devices the option to actually click on on the sticky button at the top of the page so you want to make sure that you do your research and know that i know what patterns best communicate your product main features don't just jump on a trend because that's what other apps are using make sure that it is relevant to the features that you have in your products next you have um consider the right ui for the task help users get the best, best experience while performing the task eg supporting a landscape orientation for a gaming app this is really really important and your ui is the element that your users interact with a good example is user input make sure that you reduce user input when necessary for sign up forms at times if it's not necessary don't ask for date of birth don't ask for location and all of that because it's really hard filling in forms especially on mobile devices so you want to make sure that you reduce user inputs when necessary if the input field that i want to um fill in is a phone number you can actually make suggestions of the numeric keyboard instead of giving me the alpha alphabet keyboard but if i actually want to impute a text then you can actually suggest the keypad for alphabet i was just make sure that it's actually fitting the question that you're asking at the right time so you make sure that you actually help them to pick the right keyboard to get the job done you can also use autocorrect when necessary and like i said if it's a gaming app everybody is always it's harder to actually play games in the portrait mode so make sure that your product actually supports landscape orient um, orientation and then you can even give consider the orientation lock that makes sure that it doesn't move from landscape back to portrait if they, they will get a better experience in the landscape for your application or for your product in whichever case it is so sorry just a second The next one is an the next approach is designing for VIP. The V means visual, the I is interruptible, and the P is playful. So yeah, so you have visual, interruptible, and playful. This is not very important person, it's totally different from that. This is visual, interruptible, and playful. So we'll start with visual. So visual involves taking into account your layout, your control, um, your controls, the contrast. You want and you want to make sure that all of these are intuitive. So make sure that because when a user has clear control of an app, they know what they are doing and where they are going. Each your back button, your back button makes the task return clear. I know that if I click on back button, it's going to take me back to the previous page or previous screen on a mobile application. So you want to make sure that all the controls, your layout, your contrast, everything is clear. If you are going to contrast in terms of, like now that everyone is, most people are using the dark theme on their mobile device, are you making sure that the texts are clear? Because when I switch to, um, I 
think I can't remember what it's called. Night or it was night or like light theme background. But anyways, like the difference between the dark mode and the light. Mode. If I switch back to light mode, how it displays is totally different from dark mode. So you want to make sure that the text that are clear on light mode, they are also essentially clear on dark mode. I don't want to have to squint my eyes because I want to read something on your on your product or the mobile application. So make sure that everything is clear. Next, interruptible. This involves taking account navigation, proximity, and task. We want to make sure that all these are ordered in a meaningful and clear way. Make sure that the navigations are intuitive and clear. If your navigation, make sure that the home icons actually resemble a home icon. Make sure that I know where the setting pages and the profile pages. Then proximity means that you're keeping related information or elements together. There's a law called law of proximity. That means that if two items are actually the same, make sure that you actually keep them together. Because if I see, let's say I'm looking at um, the different categories of courses on the app, and then I see the upper page of the screen, if it has um, math and physics, then there's like a spacing of like 200 pixels between the next one that says, um, technology and then product design. I'm going to be totally confused that, okay, are all these categories or technology and product design are totally different from this category. So you want to make sure that information that are meant to be together, don't give them too much spaces. At one glance, let me know that, oh yeah, these informations are related and they're supposed to be together. You can further read on the law of proximity to get like an in-depth knowledge of what it means. But that's essentially what it means, keep related information or elements together. Then playful. This involves taking into account your the emotion, context, device-based UI. Your product should always engage users. It should elicit great emotions every time they interact with it. This will keep them coming back. And essentially, you're also aiming for conversion. I don't know if you guys have ever heard um product people or like board of directors or stakeholders talk about conversion. So conversion is the retention capacity capacity of your users when they use your product. Meaning that, okay, if 20 people actually signed up for your product or started using your product a lot, do you still have that 20 people plus, let's say an additional 20 people, then that's high conversion in the sense that the people who started using your product are essentially the same people that you're maintaining and you even have higher number, like more people. Um, sorry, so, Performing tasks on mobile shouldn't have to feel like a chore. So um, make, if mobile devices, mobile devices are personal in the sense that they belong to you and you have to take them everywhere you go. I don't think if I left my mobile device at home, I would feel at ease wherever I go. I'll be like constantly thinking about it. So that's personal. So then it means that the functions that your product should deliver should also be personal. Make them fun, make them integral to your users' lives. And, that, that getting tasks done should not feel like a job. I shouldn't have to be tired after just um, signing up on your for your products. No, that shouldn't be. That's like a bad orientation and it just um, discourages users for prolonged or continuous use of your product. So performing tasks on mobile shouldn't have to feel like a job. You have to make sure that it is playful. Playful in the sense that it elicits good emotions but actually also delivers on what it says it will do. Yeah, so that's that's that. Then keep communicating. Engaging users as they perform tasks not only shows that you put them first, but can help them make informed decisions and be sure to make the right decisions. Um, the common one is the, do you want to delete this account or do you want to delete this item? And you have the prompt to ask you again, cancel or delete. A good product I think is Amazon. Amazon even when you're unsubscribing for their, um, what's it called again, their prime membership. They keep asking you, even up to the point where I want to say, oh, okay, I'm not subscribing again, it's by force. They will ask me that, oh, am I sure I want to do it down to the right moment? That's one product that I think I've interacted with and I actually like the user experience. They make sure that, okay, they are communicating. They let you know that, every, okay, this is what you want to do. Are you sure you want to do it? This is um, what you want to buy. Are you sure you want to buy? They make suggestions for you. So, Keep communicating. It makes it actually communicate to the user that oh, you are user center. Like you keep them at the heart of your product. So, in ways you can keep communicating is have a clear method to deliver 
to deliver feedback, e.g. progress bars. A good use of progress bars in mobile would be when I want to fill a form. Do I know, let's say you actually need all these informations that you actually, that you actually, um, what's it called? Let's say you actually need all the information that you're asking them at China, know. But I need to actually have like a visual understanding of how many more forms I have to fill. So that is why you see this um, visual, this green thing, this GIF that I added. So it shows you that, oh, when I fill like the first three inputs, I know that, okay, I have five more questions to go, or I'm 20% down to my completion, or I'm 80% closer to my completion or filling all the forms available. That's like a really, really good experience then you ask for confirmation when necessary this is in terms of do you want to delete this account do you want to take this action do you want to add this person to this user group do you want to add it to your basket that kind of thing that is keep communicating then keep on task a lot of um products mobile products don't actually have this and i think this is really really important when a user exits your app without completing a task the next time they log into your app, I shouldn't have to pick, I shouldn't have to start all over from the beginning. Imagine if I was applying for a job on a website and they asked me like a shit ton of questions about, you know how some of all these job applications can be that, oh, why do you want to be a designer? Tell us um, a product that you've worked on that really interests, that really made you, or that you really liked that kind of thing. But like a shit ton, like a barrage of questions anyways. Imagine if when I come back, the page are reloaded and they didn't save my data and I have to, but it's actually sitting on their job portal. I have to start all over from the beginning again. I think that's really, really tasking. I'm just going to dump that application, except you know that, okay, you're yeah, really in desperate need for an application. But to be honest, I don't think that's a good user experience. I should be able to pick up from where I stopped the last time rather than having to start afresh. Users will actually love that because you're saving me time and it shows that oh, my information is actually relevant and you actually want me to keep on this task that I'm performing. So I added an image here that says, oh, welcome back, Rick. Pick up from where you left. So you can see that this person had already done, gone through a sort of verification process. And the last, and, um, and the last page this person stopped was um, bank verification number. So this product is actually asking the person that, oh, Welcome back, pick up from where you left, rather than starting again to feel, to go through all the old verification stages again. I think this is a really, really good experience added to their design for their products. So yeah, I think we're done. Yes, yeah, so we are done. So those are the approaches for designing for mobile. You have to fit the task, fit, um, fit the user, the UI style guide, make sure that you keep communicating and make sure that the users can actually recover or pick up from wherever the left while interacting with your product. Next, we have um, guidelines and best practices when you're designing a product for mobile. All of these guidelines and best practices, there are like actually a whole lot of guidelines and best practice, practices. But the one I've actually um, listed here, that ones that there are just a few, but I put on a reference whereby you can actually see more practices and read more articles a lot of other articles, if you want, I can add, give you guys links to read on best practices. But in order to save time and not to go over our time, I just added just a few one of them. So, yeah, so some guidelines and best practices when designing for mobile. There are many things to consider when designing for mobile. Today, mobile users expect a lot from an app, fast loading time, ease of use, your delight your interaction. All of these are part of the UX of your product and is what differentiates successful product from unsuccessful ones. And you actually make, want to make sure that your own product is actually in the su um, successful niche. So we're going to be looking at some recommended best practices and tips to guide you when designing products for mobile use. First and foremost, you have to keep it simple, stupid. It's called KISS. So that's the full meaning of, sorry for that sound. That's the full meaning of KISS. Keep it simple, stupid. You don't want to overwhelm your users just because you know that, oh, I have like a whole lot of features that I want to put in my product, but there's little space on the home page. Don't overwhelm them. Users with page after page of, and even with the, um, data collection. So this goes back to the user input I was talking about. 
if the data is not important, just ignore it. Like, don't ask for it. Because typing on mobile isn't the most comfortable experience. It's simply not practical to try and extract the same volumes of data from a user that you would extract when the user is actually using it on your desktop. So you want to make sure they're using smart features for ease of typing, which in this case can be auto-correct um, auto -correct and um, what's it called? Auto-completion, yeah. Auto-completion and auto-correct on the part of the user. So make sure that you keep it simple, stupid, and you try to reduce the user inputs wherever necessary. And you're sticking that your data collection is only to the bare minimum and only to essential data only. Next, declutter. Don't fill out your design. So back to the fact that you have many features and you want them to actually use all of those features does not mean that you have to overwhelm them and fill everything on your design such that there's clutter. Clutter is one of the worst enemies of good design. By cluttering your interface, you overload your users with too much information. Every button that you add, every image, every icon is taking up space and filling up the whole design. So you want to make sure that you're sticking it to only what's like on the basis of what is necessary to, so yeah, to say on the basis of what is necessary. So because every image, every button that you add is actually making the screen more complicated and it's just taking up space that might not actually even be necessary. So re remember that mobile has its estate room, so you don't want to overwhelm them. You want to present your user with only what they need to know. Yeah, sorry, just... Yeah, sorry for that. Okay. So um that's for so that's for declutter. Make sure that even times when you actually you've launched your product and then you've done user testing, you've gotten feedback, if you know that the features are too much or too overwhelming, you can actually that's where reiteration comes in and after your user testing, retreat your design several times, let you them communicate to the users. Ask them, or oh, do they think that this is overwhelming? They think your interface are too much. Can they see their main task? Do they know what they're supposed to do on every screen? That will help you to declutter your, your mobile product design interface, yeah? Next is minimize cognitive load. Cognitive load is something I, I think each and every one of us at one point while interacting with any mobile product have actually experienced, but we might not have known that that's the coined term for it. So cognitive load refers here to the amount of brain power required to use the app. It occurs when a user is confronted with an interface that appears to be intuitive but delivers unexpected results. And um, hence, making the user use his working memory to process information and deal with what is going on on the screen. So in short terms, cognitive load is when I, as a user, am I'm thinking for the product designer or for the product owner. I'm literally the one teaching or guiding myself on how to use a product. A product interface should actually be intuitive. I shouldn't have to think too much to know that, oh, this is what you're trying to tell me to do. This is what you're trying to communicate. It's almost like this um, Stephen Krug's book that says, don't make me think. You should never make your users do the thinking for you. The interface should behave the way users expect it to behave. And a legit example of a cognitive friction is, imagine if you visited a website and you saw a button on that side that said um, sign up, but when you clicked on the button, it took you to another website that is showing you today's news or like maybe showing you punch news, articles about Donald Trump. I think I'm going to be asking that, I don't understand like what's happening here. I was, when I clicked on sign up button, it's supposed to essentially show me a form that asked me for information and sign up to your product. So that's example of cognitive friction in, the, in a digital product because your expectation was to be taken to a sign up screen that asked you for information about yourself and not to be redirected um, entirely elsewhere on the internet. So you want to make sure that there's really no cognitive load on your product. Make sure that your interface behaves the way users expect it to behave. Next one is use recognizable UI elements. In the age where um, every designer is trying to 
I'll change the next one. And then there are people who are like skilled in like um, element icons, design, so to speak. Make sure that you're not deviating from the status quo. This has been a staple of UI design for a long time. There's a reason that folders for computer files look like paper files for look like paper files for a filing cabinet. And there's also a reason that the delete function resembles a trash because these things are are set to mimic the real world, the real world object, so to say. So they deliver real world expectations for digital experiences. The more the object within the UI makes a real world object, the more likely that object is going to be intuitive to use and deliver a quality user experience. It's what we call skeuomorphism. I don't know if you guys have ever heard of skeuomorphism. There's another one called neomorphism. I mean, one time last, this time last year, I think neomorphism was even trending. But if you don't, here's the definition. Skeuomorphism is where an object in software mimics its real world counterpart. The trash can is a perfect example, which is also the delete function. We can all agree that the delete icon you know, function. The delete icon actually resembles a trash. So don't try to be smart and then you create confusion for your users. You have to stick to the status quo. I'm not saying you should not add your own elements such that when users actually see your product, they know, oh, that's that um product icon is actually for Paystack or that product icon is actually for Twitter. You can add your own element of uniqueness, maybe like an extra stroke where necessary and all of that. So that when people see it, they can able to link it to your product or your brand. But then again, never deviate completely from the norm. You don't want to make your users think too hard to know that that's the delete icon. When I see a home icon, I should know that this is a home icon. And we can all say that a home icon actually resembles a proper hut or a proper home, like those ones we used to draw when we we're in like primary schools and all of that. So make sure that you always incorporate that real um the real word counterparts of your icons don't go to, don't deviate too much from the status quo from like the norm stick to what users already know it helps their brain and it actually prevents cognitive friction like we just said so it helps their brain process information faster and they know what they're supposed to do on any interface to find yourself next thing you have to make your navigation simple helping users navigate should be a, a high priority for every um every app and every product all the cool features and compelling content that your app has won't matter if you can't find them. Also, if it takes too much time or effort to discover how to navigate your products, chances are you're just going to lose your users. So if users, users should be able to explore the app and you know, intuitively and to complete all primary tasks without any expansion. So that is when they say, oh, design should be intuitive. It's not just for saying sake, it actually should be. Your navigation should be simple. Focus very much on, on the key tasks that your, um, that your product is supposed to deliver. Provide clear navigation clues. Okay, if you attach um, like a back button on a page, you can also add like the name, like let's say this back um, icon. You can also put where it takes them to. That way I'm clear on where, if I click this button, it's going to take me to. Let me know what goes on at every point in time on your, on your app in terms of navigation. Wait, this icon, that's why some icons, that's why naturally, um, preferably for me, I like the um, navigation text that actually come, like the icons that come with the text. So that if I put the home icon, I'm also writing a descriptive text that says for home. Because if I use an icon that, let's say, someone who has never seen a home, I mean, it's almost impossible, but let's just say, because you're supposed to actually, um, Think as though your users don't know anything about your product as if they don't know anything. So if I put home, the users can read, the users can read and say, oh, this home, this icon means home and it's going to take me to the first page or the first page of contact on my product app. So you have to make sure that you're making your navigation simple and it is clear on what it does. So now I've listed some more ways that you can make your navigation simple using standard or familiar navigation components. We all know that on iOS, there's this tab, and then Android has this navigation draw. They essentially, they actually do the same thing. So for Android device, um, Android people, they already expect that when they click on the hamburger, it should open up this navigation draw. So stick to that because that is what they are used to. Don't deviate too much from the status quo, especially when it comes to platforms. Be consistent with your primary navigation pattern. Don't use a side drawer in one part of the app and then you're using a tab by another. 
it's going to confuse them because if they are used to a side draw and they know that, okay, that is where everything is listed. So if I now go to the settings page and I am not using a tab, I'm just going to be confused that, oh, ideally I should be looking for a hamburger icon such that when I click on it, it's going to open up more options. So you have to make sure that you are consistent, communicate, you should always know where they are in your app at any moment and also how to get back to where they were previously. That's the back button and also telling them where it takes them. Failing to indicate the current location is a very common problem of many mobile app menus. Where am I is one of the fundamental questions users need to answer in order to successfully navigate. I shouldn't be fighting with your mobile product and asking myself, oh my God, where is this on the page? How do I get back to where I was before? You should always communicate clearly. Let them know where they are without even asking. Make your breadcrumbs explicit. So if you use a back button, put a label on it to tell the user where it takes them. That way it is intuitive and it also helps them to make the right decisions at every point while interacting with your mobile product. Next guideline is watch the interface, one-handed operation. These are literally all thumbs when it comes to mobile devices. So you want to consider hand controls and thumbs up. You want to make sure that your controls on the mobile interface, they are placed at reasonable and easy reach. The thumb zone is the area of a phone screen that can be easily assessed with the thumb when a person is holding their phone with one hand. I, as a person, I actually use one hand to hold my phone. So I'm usually using my thumb when I'm clicking. But things that are located at the extreme upper part, they are usually hard to reach. So I always then have to use one like two fingers, which I think is like an onus on me anyways. So here I've added images. A lot of users hold their mobile device with one hand thereby making only a part of the screen of easy reach for them like I demonstrated. So 49% of people usually they're like one-handed, 36% are cradled and 15% are two-handed. So if you, I don't know if the image is like really clear for you guys, but you can see like the different touch points on your mobile device. So I'll use my phone as a demonstration. So this, um, the top left, the hard to reach because imagine if I was holding my phone like this, my thumb can't stretch um, past this point. So imagine if I actually put something here, I'll have to overreach. So that's overreaching and you don't want that for your users. Then the yellow part that not extend is it's still a stretch a little bit to be honest, but it's actually okay to reach. But this gray, um, the green areas like from here to here, sorry. But the green areas, like from here to here, they're like really, really, really hard to control. So that's easy and that's a natural reach because if I'm holding my phone like this, then it's actually very, very easy for me to like just click on any control that you actually put up. So knowing this, you want to make sure that your task can be completed with someone's thumb. If I can't complete my task with your thumb, I think you might have to re rethink your product design approach. Is someone trying to say something? Now, yeah. all right. So yes, yeah, so I think this is one really, really important because a lot of people actually use one thumb to actually hold their phone. So this is something you want to put in mind when you're designing your product for mobile use. Then next one, which is also really important is design finger-friendly buttons. So when designing actionable elements in a mobile interface, it's important to make the targets big enough so that they are easy for users to tap Mistaken taps often happen due to small touch controls. Even when I'm interacting with some products, especially on iOS, because I'm familiar with iOS devices, there's actually is a more, um, more acceptable way of actually placing your controls in terms of cancel and delete. I'm already used to iOS um, control that says cancel and delete, and I expect it to be on the right-hand side. But if I'm interacting with a product and it actually puts because my brain already knows that, oh, the delete button is always on the right. Imagine if I'm not inter interacting with your product and then the delete is on the left and I actually mistakenly go and press that when I actually wanted to press cancel. That's it. And it's actually not even big enough. It's not even communicating to ask me again if I actually want to cancel or delete that item. Then I've lost the whole progress of whatever thing I was working on. So you have to make sure that your, your buttons are finger friendly. I have a friend that actually designs, his buttons are always like six to five pixels in height and I actually don't blame me. That's because you want to make sure that the whole tab area is 
big enough for users to actually tap and they don't make mistakes. So the size of the target is as important as the space in between the targets. So that's important. It's one thing for your target area to be big, but the spacing between two elements, like a cancel and a delete button, should actually be obvious and it should actually be much, not too wide, but actually such that, okay, I'm not mistakenly going to press a delete button instead of a cancel button. So if two touch targets are near each other, ensure that there's the right amount of space between them. The iOS, Apple recommends a minimum target size of 44 pixels by 44 pixels. Android Google, which is Google, recommends a minimum target size of 48 DP by 48 DP. So um, for Android people, or for Android devices, right, the story, the um, measurement is in DP, while for iOS is in pixels. And if you're used to designing in Figma, you know that you're designing using PX. So if you're handing off to your developers, make sure that and they're, they're um, developing for Android, make sure that you give them the appropriate conversion. That's just a side note that I'm just saying anyways. But yeah, so look at what I was talking about. So look at this image now. You can see that the first image, the cancel and the delete button, they're like so closely tight, they're like closely tight. So imagine if I now press on delete instead of cancel and there's no feedback that, oh, are you sure you want to delete this text? Are you sure you want to delete this order? That's going to be a loss to me because then I have to start again all over what I was doing. So the best one is this one with the green mark, whereby the cancel is totally far apart from the delete button. So always make sure, so note that the, sorry, that the spacing between the targets is as important as the size of the target. Bear that in mind and you see that users actually make less errors or like less mistakes when they're interacting with your product. Next, consider the user first time experience. Your user, like I said earlier, conversion is really important. I, at, when I was working on news, this was something the stakeholders used to scream because it's in conversion that you actually get your money back. So your customer retention or conversion starts from the first time a user interacts with your product, which is oftentimes, sorry, excuse me, is oftentimes the make or break part of the product because this is where you either leave a lasting impression or not at all. I believe that the first time I'm interacting with your product is your best shirt at giving me an impression that will either make me use the product again or abandon it. So you want to decide, you want users to abandon your product or you want them to actually reuse your product and keep them coming back for more. So you want to keep things simple and focus on the main task when a user first interacts with your product. If it's confusing or hard to carry out a task the first time your app is used, it's very, very likely that it will never be used again. Consider Jacob's law. That's another design, design law. It's called Jacob's law. So it says that users spend most of their time on other side. So this means that if as a user, I'm coming to interact with your product, that means I expect it to work the same way all others that I already know work. A non-digital product example I would give is, um, let's say vitamin C. So it's like me buying a red vitamin C. Everyone knows that the red vitamin C is like sweeter than the white vitamin C. So if I'm buying a red vitamin C, or I'm used to buying a red vitamin C from a brand called um, Calgo, then I go next time to the pharmacy and then they tell me that, oh, we don't have cow vitamin C today, but we have Spartan C. I'm like, okay, well, I mean, it's still vitamin C, it's supposed to taste the same way, yeah? So I buy the Spartan C's one. Then when getting home and I try to take one vitamin C from Spartan C, then I see that, oh, it tastes bitter. I'm basically like, I don't understand. Like, what's happening here? Like, why is it bitter? Like, because the normal, the normal thing is everyone knows that the red vitamin C is supposed to be sweet. So explain why your own brand zone is bitter. So that's like a perfect non-digital product example for why you should actually consider using that first time of experience. Because I know in that, oh, vitamin C's um, red vitamin C is not as sweet as it claims to be. The next time I go to the pharmacy, I either leave if they tell me you don't have cargo or I and go somewhere else that have cargo. I insist that they actually give me cargo. So that's how it works, even for digital products. So always consider that first time of experience. Make sure that you catch the attention. Make sure that you leave a long lasting impression on your users. And you see that they will always come back for more. Next thing, which is very, very important, is design for network interruption. In 
a time and age, especially in this part of the world, I mean, if you're in the US, in the UK, or in like the more developed countries, I would really say that mobile connectivity is a big issue. But I think like in Nigeria, um, mobile connections can actually be a colossal damage in areas with patchy service. For countries like US and Europe, like I said, this might not be the case as mobile connectivity is ubiquitous. Like you can find it everywhere. It's like a free thing. I can go to the um to the mall and I get connected to the Wi-Fi and I'm not out on internet use. But this is not a case worldwide. So you have to have to make sure that your product caters for this. So your product has to be able to perform in the case of slow or poor connectivity. So are you saying that oh, because I don't have connection on my phone, the data that I loaded before I left to be available. Because an example is when I travel and I, I don't know my way around, I always on the um what's it called the travel the travel app, I always leave the direction such that even when I go out and for some reason I can't connect to the internet, I'm still able to load the previous data so I won't be stranded. So it can be really hard on users if they lose all their data just because they have slow or poor connection. Now we all know how when our connection is bad, how it's really, really frustrating. A good product that actually takes into cognizance this is Google Maps. Like Google Maps, even when I was leaving home today to come to a friend's place and I checked the traffic data, because my internet at my place wasn't like so, so good, it still gave me data to actually guide me that, okay, even, even if I can't get traffic data, but at least I can find my way to my destination because essentially a map is supposed to actually direct you. So not only is it doing what it says to do, but it's giving me an alternative that, okay, even if my connection is bad, I still get traffic data. So Google map actually shows you, the, it gives you the direction, but then once your connection is good, it gives you like um, real time, real time traffic data, which I think is good because you can't have it on, I mean, but then it's like a 50, 50. So yeah, so that's an example of a digital product that actually designed for network interruption. So what then can you do? Some ways in which you can do is um, try caching data in, development, there's something called caching data. That means you're retaining data, so it's not lost in a connection break, which is Google Map. So even if my network was good and I got traffic data, it doesn't mean that I'm going to go totally offline and not be able to find my routes to where I'm going to. It catches the data and then, and your websites actually do some things. You know that, that's why um, there are bookmarks. Too. I think bookmarks is an example. And also you notice that if you're typing on a website because you visited it before it does the auto completion and then it loads the data from the previous time google actually also does that i think this is actually a good brand but that's by design anyways um next thing is um optimize your product for rapid loading because there's some in, um information i believe that text are actually more important for um than image when it comes to that's a personal preference your personal thought in a sense that when you're coding there's this thing that you add so that if the image doesn't load fast, you add a text description that lets you know that, oh, I'm expecting um, a picture or an image of someone holding a box or holding um, a boom box. So you have to minimize page size by keeping images and other weighty content to a minimum. Load the content first, like the text content first, and then you can now load the heavy image or GIFs or features that are embedded in your product design later on when the connection is good this reduces the size of that content and it helps to focus on rapid loading so for more reference on best practices for designing for mobile you can check out the smashing magazine you can check out ux design cc i would if you guys want i will share some links on all that things or like articles you can read up about for mobile product designing if you guys want well for now these are all the approaches i have or the guidelines rather and best practices when you're designing for mobile with this in mind, they're like the core basic ones. So with this in mind, I think that you'll be able to develop like a great experience for your mobile product. And then you see that your users are satisfied. So next now, you already know how to design, you've done your research, you know your the different scenarios of your users, you know that, okay, you know the guidelines, you know what you're going to do, you know the mistakes your competing product did and you don't want to repeat the same then you now actually want to design but you decided to actually launch for both your mobile ios and mobile android so now you want your developers to actually infuse maybe elements from both or you want it to be native to their individual platform so then what are the key differences between ios and and android first the design guideline so i believe that if you're probably um setting out to build a product a mobile protocol iOS and Android, you have to familiarize yourself with the different platforms because 
the elements used in iOS are totally different from the elements used in Android. So in order to ensure that you're building a product best suited for the mobile device it's going to be used on, you need to follow the platform's guidelines. That is either the human interface guidelines, HID for iOS, or you follow material design, which is for Android. You should also communicate with the developers and get them involved early on in your design process so they can immediately know if what you're designing is technically um, feasible on the developmental level. So this is something I like to do. If I'm going to design something and I want to make it easier for the developers, I always ask them, oh, are you using um, a particular design library? Like are you using Ant Design or are you using um, Atomic Design or any no, material, material design guide? So let me know. That way I can infuse elements from all the design guide and it's easier for them to actually replicate my design and give me the exact same thing I designed. So as a product designer, you want to make sure that you communicate with the people that are going to transform your design to code because there's really, that's where the joy is for me, seeing my design come to life and that's only made possible by the developers. So make sure that you, even as a designer, you, you familiarize yourself, you know what should change and what should know that, oh, if I'm going to use the floating action button in Android, like now everybody knows that the FAB, that's the floating action button, is being used even in an iOS um, in an iOS product and also in an Android product. But it, at the very beginning, it was something that was only for Android, whereas iOS would always put theirs at the top right corner, but Android would always put it as a floating action button by the extreme right and bottom right hand corner. But now it's infused into both. So we all know that, oh, if I see a floating action button in an iOS product, I know that, okay, it is acceptable. So you have to know what is going to change and what you can actually infuse from another platform. Don't just copy everything at once. Yeah, so that's, so you can check just the link to, just the link to the different platform for iOS and Android. I've linked it in the, in the slides, yeah. So next one is navigation, which is one apparent difference. The top of the screen, the primary, the secondary, and it's back. So navigation helps users move around the mobile app and perform actions. So you have top of the screen navigation. So the left-hand side is for iOS. iOS, the previous screen, the current screen, and action button. So you have the previous screen in terms of mailboxes, your current screen, which is inbox, and then your action button, which is edit. If you come over to an Android device, you will see that all of these are embedded in a drawer menu. Is when you click on this drawer menu, which is also called hamburger menu, that you will see you'll be able to access the previous screen. The page title is the current screen. Then you now have a search bar, which is um, optional. And then you have this um, thing as the action button over here. So that's what difference. Next, for primary navigation. So this how what on um, WhatsApp on we're all familiar with WhatsApp. This is how WhatsApp on iOS looks, and this is how WhatsApp on Android looks. So these are called tab bars. Your status, um, what's this again? Camera chat settings. They are called tab bars in iOS, and they're usually no more than two to five. If you actually place them more than five, they they are distracting and they get squashed up. Like and the tab which will very won't be even up to forty four pixels or like forty eight pixels. So you have to make sure that you, you keep to a minimum of two to five and they're placed at the bottom of the screen. So it gives users the ability to switch between different sections of the app. Whereas in Android, they are placed at the top, as you can see, they're placed at the top. So these are spread across the entire interface. And then you also have the FAB, which is the floating one, whereas you can start a new conversation. That's for Android. So you can see that they're totally different. So WhatsApp make sure that they actually studied the different platform before shipping their what's um their product to the market so they they stuck to yeah, i think the english is correct sorry they stuck to the ios um platform guidelines and they actually make sure that they stuck to the android platform guideline which is material design excuse me so next thing you have the secondary navigation so secondary navigation are like not top level, they're like the next level navigations within your application. They are all usually found in more for most products. So there are other things, they're not like the primary things you can do, but there are other things that also come with your products. So in iOS, you will usually find them under the more section, while for Android, you find them in your hamburger menu, which is at the top left corner of the top navigation as well. And that's, that is this. 
And usually that's also where the profile image, your profile details are usually located as well in Android. So next you have the back navigation. So this is accessed by pressing back or usually a back icon with the label, like in this case, which is no boxes with the back icon at the upper left of the screen or sliding the screen. I also has this um, screen sliding option where you can slide your screen left to right and it switches between your previous tab and your current tab. Android, by contrast, they offer a built system back button, which is this one, if you can see my cursor. So that is inbuilt, but iOS doesn't have that. So it acts similarly to have a back button on the web works, on your web browser works. So it brings you back to the last screen you were on within the app or across multiple visited apps. So you have to be careful when you're designing for Android and for iOS. Know where the back button is supposed to take the user to and how it actually differentiates across both platforms. Now is tabs. So tabs, the way tabs are, generally they're called tabs, but in iOS, iOS calls them segmented controls. And you see the field one shows you your current screen while the non-field one, which is in scale vegetable, shows you another screen that you can click on, it takes you there. But for Android, Android is a flat design based tabs. So you have explore flight trips, in which you can switch between each one of them. Like this screen is currently on trips. And then the less or the inactive ones are other ones within the applications like vegetables is for the iOS. So that's tabs. Models. Models in iOS too. It's totally different from how they appear in Android. As you can see, this is the common one for iOS and for this Android, they are more of like a text and no yes kind of vibe. Or well, Android has this one that are like well segmented and are like almost like buttons, so to say. So yeah, so that's what iOS calls it alert, while Android calls it dialogues. Yep. So now you have bottom sheets. So I and this like design I think iOS just like recently bought. So iOS, they are called action menus that can be triggered by any action. You can click on anything in your bot in the bottom part, bottom tab of the iOS, and to trigger this um this action menu of, as they are called bottom sheets in Android. So they slide from the bottom of Android. The action menus on Android they appear after tapping the three dots menu which can also be called more options. And this is how they are stacked. Last that. So I'm done. Thank you for listening. That's all for designing products for mobile. So we got to, yeah, I think, yeah. So yeah, so that's it. If you have any questions, you can ask them raise your hand and everything yeah but that's all so questions you can ask me anything whether we're related or not related yet yeah. you're welcome so i'm just going to take it back this thing is actually annoying so you guys can unmute yourself. So if you have questions, you want to ask anything I touched or anything about design generally, this is the time to ask me. I think, um, hi, doing. sorry. I don't know if you're still on this call, but do we still have more time? It's like one for tonight. Oh, she's muted. Okay, so does anyone have any questions? No. Hi, Nika. Can you hear me? Okay, yes, I can. Yes, so hi, everyone. My name is Damlola. Um, a UI UX designer. Thank you very much for your presentation. 
Okay, so my question now is just from your just the way you explained that I mean the design system for mobile is um for iOS is different from the design system for um Android, right? How do I maintain? Is there like a chip? Is there a trick to it to maintain consistency above all platforms, considering like they have different elements and all of that? And I want to design a consistent look. I don't want um the iOS design to look too different from the Android design, is there like a trick to it to just make everything look consistent across all platforms? So for, okay, thanks for your question, Emma. So for, um, that's actually a very good question because you notice, I don't know if everyone is familiar with CarryWise, you see that CarryWise, the way the interface looks on iOS is not, um, I would say 92%, it's not like totally different from how it looks on Android. And that's because they make use of, um, they, use, they go through the route of native design. So I don't know if any, there's anyone with like a developed um, coding background, there's called something called native, native development. So um, your code actually works. That's if you use React Native, for example, it works both on Android and iOS. So you can go with native design. So you're designing elements that would actually suit both instances. Like the segment control I showed you guys on, on, on iOS, you could actually infuse the same thing on Android, especially if um, you have like smart developers, because I am my workplace, for, for instance, because I'm more com comfortable designing for iOS. I actually just design our products for iOS, but the Android guys knows to infuse only elements like the buttons, for example, in Android, they're usually flat space. They have no elevation compared to iOS that actually have like um, raised elevation. So he knows that in that scenario, his buttons are just going to be a little bit elevated or that. But other than that, all the designs are like the same. So that's when the native design comes in. So you can read up about native design. That's your best bet. If you know that you want to, your, want to ensure consistency and you just don't want to stick to one platform design guideline for each of your products on any um, device. Did I answer your question? Yes, Nikkei, thank you very much. You're welcome. Does anybody else want to ask? Let's see. It says, can I say, um, but the beef with Android is real though. There's really no beef. I would even like to you guys, I struggle when I want to design for Android. I mean, I've been designing for a year, a year and yeah, I would say it's a year, January, yes. I've been designing fully like fully only designed for a year. But the first time I was actually, was a freelance gig that got to design for Android. I had to like read all of their guidelines, but because I don't use an Android device, so it's harder because I had to start asking people that use Android that, oh, when you do this on your Android, how do you do this, how do you do that? I won't lie, it's like harder when you don't interact with product. But then as a designer, you can't really be, you can't really be a beggar. Like your beggar does not have a choice. So you can't really say, oh, I want to just stick to designing for iOS. Probably if you're working with like a more structured company, they would actually ask you oh, iOS or Android when I more like more comfortable. But I think it's just better when you're like familiar with a device. It's easier for you to design. Like, I mean, I can design virtually anything I want to design for iOS compared to Android. It's, it's really, really hard. But now we're standing on that. That's why I like people who like to go the native route. That's why I told Dami, um, the person that asked the last question that just go the native route. Like a lot of I think a lot of products, only WhatsApp and maybe YouTube, their interface on Android and iOS. I mean, I've noticed personally is actually like totally different. Every most other product just because they can't kill themselves. I mean, they just try to infuse elements they know will work for both. So I think that's the way. So it's not a beef, uh, Michael. It's actually not a beef. It's just it's just how it is to be honest. So yeah, so. Any other person question? I don't know. Are you guys shy? I don't know how much time we have, but I think it's supposed to like go on for like two more hours. Um, okay. Or you can just give your um give your question to doing. You can just Hi. Oh, good afternoon. Um, not just, like you said, you are going to drop some links for the mobile design. Yes, I'm going to. I'm going to share with um 
be doing, and she was going to mail it to you guys with the slides. Oh. If that's fine. Right. Yeah, that's cool. Thank you. So if you want more links to any other thing, maybe resources, you can also let me know. I would definitely share. I would oh. definitely share it with her as well. So you can just drop it in the chat or like drop it in and let her let me know. I'll send everything at once. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, I really hope you guys learned something from this from this session. I really hope. Yeah, I did very well. So thank you very much. I thank you too for listening. Okay. Um, doing sorry, are you still on the call? Hi. Yes, I am. Thank you so much, uh, Adenike for your time i'm sure everybody i'm sure we're all able to like learn one or two things new things actually thank you very very much nice having a session hope you had fun with the learners as well yes yes i feel like they're quite quite quiet like a few people want to talk i mean i used to be saying well when i'm like a session i don't want to ask questions but all right so is it is there like is there is there an avenue or is it possible for them to maybe reach out to you on uh maybe any of the social media platforms say in the case where they have issues maybe your twitter or linkedin yeah anyone i'll drop my linkedin and uh, my Twitter handle. So you can just send me a, a DM with that. Or, but I'm always active on LinkedIn, to be honest. So you can, okay. kind of, you can just add an extra note in the LinkedIn message that says, oh, from Twitter, and then I'll add Because I hardly use my Twitter, to be honest. But I'm just going to drop it. Okay. All right. Thank you very much, um, Adenike. Yes. Uh, the session is supposed to be for two, uh, one to two hours. So. Oh, okay. Yes, Thank you. you. Go, go, go. Yes. Enjoy the rest of your day. Bye. Bye. Thank you so much. I've dropped the LinkedIn and Twitter handle. So. Okay. Yeah. All right. Bye. Hey, everyone. Thank you for joining the call, everybody. Uh, we'll be sharing your assignments as soon as uh, Adenike forwards it to us. Yeah. Yes, I'll, I'll do that. All right. Enjoy the rest of your day. Bye. 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 B